awfully tiny spoon you got there. For this video, I should make a thumbnail like, Ooh. <laughs> or, <gasps> yeah. What does a scared person do? Faints, like, ah! Oh. Yeah. Ah. Recently, I've seen a lot of YouTube videos that are attempting to address the question, is true crime good or bad? And here's the thing. I get where they're coming from, and I think that there are questions surrounding the ethics of true crime that we should be asking ourselves. But the question of whether or not it's ethical to produce true crime content, I think is neither here nor there. That pony done got out of the gate. What is it? The dog doesn't hunt. The do that dog won't hunt. True crime has been a popular genre since the 19th century, and it's not going anywhere. Like, our appetite for it has only grown over the years. I think that the question that we need to be asking ourselves is what kind of true crime are we consuming? In the same way that now we're like, where did this milk come from? Could I buy eggs sourced from happier chickens? Okay, now. I'm gonna get into some of the true crime YouTubers that I follow and that I think you might be interested in as well. Let's start with a group of YouTubers that I'm gonna call the Googlers. These true crime YouTubers I think are very responsible with the content and they come at you right up front and say, hey, I'm not a journalist, I'm not a detective, I'm just a person with the internet. Okay. Quickly, before we get into the case, I do just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. Uh, Eleanor Neal, Molly Westbrook, I would say that they fall into that category. Then there's what I'm gonna call the book report YouTubers. Uh, Stephanie Harlow, I would say, is the queen of this group. She puts a ton of research into her videos. They're super long. Yeah, you have to be ready to really, really take notes when you watch one of her videos. I think that there are some formats of true crime videos that we've seen rise in popularity that do a disservice to the victims and to the genre of true crime as a whole. It makes us look bad. A lot of true crime videos on YouTube feature mukbangs, which is an eating show, which is someone usually eating a lot of very decadent, sumptuous foods. In the Paige Christie's video, she specifically reacts to the Stephanie Sue video that addresses the Lauren Smithfield case. Lauren Smithfield is a young woman whose family has really had to struggle to get attention on their daughter's case and really had to fight with law enforcement to open up an investigation. Guacamole is insane. I'm kind of spicy now. Oh my gosh. Let me try this quesadilla. I don't know why, I'm normally a taco person, but this quesadilla was calling my name. Mm. Mm. Now, today's case that I'm talking about, I saw on TikTok, and it, I didn't really want to talk about it because, I don't know, I guess I- Eight minutes and 12 seconds. Eight minutes and 12 seconds. Eight minutes and 12 seconds to talk about the Lauren Smithfield case. That's eight minutes and 12 seconds of a 40 minute video. So that's almost 25% of the entire video just- eating and sponsors. Yeah, that's no good. <laughs> that's simply no good. I think with Stephanie Sue, hands up, I admit, I used to watch her videos. And I think the reason why it never really struck me is all that off-putting, because Stephanie Sue is such a cute, sunny person that it just is so kind of a strange disconnect. Even if you're not putting yourself in the victim's shoes, you should at least be feeling some measure of disgust at what's happened. And disgust is, by definition, unappetizing. So what is it about ha a massive appetite and these incredibly disgusting events that goes together? It doesn't. It clashes. And we need to walk away. 
And then we come to the true crime makeup YouTubers. My name is Bailey Sarian and today is Monday, which means it's murder, mystery, and makeup Monday. On the one hand, I can see how putting on makeup, it's sort of fripperous, it's lighthearted, it's skin deep. So again, it doesn't really match the tone of the very serious and grim cases that they're going over. But at the same time, in the language of YouTube, putting on makeup while you do a video is such a common eye-catching gimmick that to me, it just speaks more to the fact that the audience is largely women. I just don't know that it's deeper than that. But I don't know. If you think I'm wrong, let me know. I'm open to the idea that I'm wrong about that. I think Ada On Demand made the best point I saw about why true crime and makeup aren't a good combination. So let's have a listen. Amandra Vickery, a professor of psychology at Illinois Wesleyan University, <laughs> kind of like weighed in on this format by saying, quote, one potential reason these types of videos could be appealing to people is because the makeup component may take the focus off of the more horrifying true crime elements. In other words, many people want their true crime fix, but nothing too emotionally upsetting. And I'm sorry, like that just... That just doesn't cut it for me anymore. Like it, it used to for sure, <laughs> but it doesn't anymore. And let me tell you why. Using like little jokes or like just the application of makeup as like a barrier to confronting how like truly upsetting and horrible a lot, a lot of these cases are. I, I think it's I think it's wrong because while you're trying to make true crime more like comfortable or even like palatable for you even hear about, I always try and think about how like the victim didn't get the opportunity. Their families don't get to tone down like the horror of like waking up every day without their loved one. So it just seems like a little selfish to have to rely on like this content format to hear about these cases because at that point you're really just admitting that you're using these people's trauma and pain and deaths for solely entertainment and you only want it like packaged in a way that's palatable for you. I can't bring up Bailey Sarian without talking about this interview that she did with Nancy Grace. In it, Nancy Grace talks about her fiance's murder and then Bailey Sarian pauses, makes a sad face, and then goes back to putting on her makeup. When he came back in, a guy that had worked for the construction company and gotten fired before Keith started working there was standing there, sees the company truck and unloads and murders him for nothing. What? I'm so sorry. The part of that that is relevant now is that I know what happened. At least I have that. I think this demonstrates that Bailey Sarian isn't without sympathy when she talks about these kinds of gruesome cases. She just doesn't see putting on makeup as being out of step with that kind of heavy conversation. There are also a lot of YouTubers that I would argue take a more exploitative approach to the material. Mr. Ballin is a YouTuber that I see where his thumbnails are always like, just seems like they're really amping up the isn't this scary side of the story. Although for the, for this for this video I should make a thumbnail like Ooh. <laughs> I've also seen a lot of thumbnails that will feature something like the word psychopath or is he a narcissist? Those kinds of catchy, buzzy words that people like to throw around all the time, even though those are clinical diagnoses that anyone will tell you. We can't really know what was up with someone or what their mental disorder was unless that person was their psychologist. It's serious material and you should probably treat it seriously and not just as clickbait. <laughs> There are the YouTubers that I see having the most interaction with victims' relatives. Georgia Marie, Danielle Holan, Kendall Ray are all really big true crime YouTubers, and with a lot of their videos, they actually get a lot of input from the family members, and that really informs the content that they make. This one, have you had doubts about doing true crime content and fear of trivializing the pain of the victims and their families? Yes. Um, this is one of the biggest things I think about when I'm making my content now. And I'm not gonna lie, it wasn't always something I was aware of. Like in the very, very early days of doing this, it was just a mystery. And then as I've done it over the years, I've spoken to family members and I've learned and I've listened. 
and I've realised that there is such a space for true crime on the internet in terms of being able to actually help, like the difference you can make in cases like this by just talking about them. There's one case I've covered on my channel and I don't think I can say which case it is because it's all sort of ongoing, but I speak to the person who, like the family member who helped me make the video and so many huge things have happened on the back of me making that video and I don't know why I'm about to cry. <laughs> Let me keep... And I do think there's such a thin line between viewing these videos as entertainment and of course they are entertaining because people watch them because they find them entertaining but also you've got to be responsible and you've got to be a responsible viewer of true crime or something I say all the time. You've actually got to discuss with the people, with the families you're talking about. You might notice I don't really tend to cover recent cases in the last 10 years maybe unless it's working with the family. This is another one of the reasons why I don't really do solved cases on my channel because I feel like once they've been solved there's nothing I can do that's going to help or going to add to it unless there's some sort of point I can make on social justice or there was a big law that came out of it and it will sort of like help people spread awareness still by talking about it. I don't like to talk about solved cases. They're also often requested to make true crime YouTube videos and this I feel like is what really gets left out of the isn't true crime kind of gross and bad argument that I've seen online is that there are a lot of victims family members who are saying in comments under YouTube videos like, can you please cover my sister's case? Can you please talk about my best friend? And they'll go from channel to channel saying like, I really need eyes on this. This has totally fallen off the media's radar. And they're really desperate to get their case out there in hopes that if somebody knows something, maybe they'll see the YouTube video and come forward. So there are true crime YouTube channels that are actually performing a service. For example, have a listen to this clip from a recent episode of Mile Higher, a podcast that Kendall Ray does with her husband. Uh, in this episode, she's interviewing Michelle Mims, the sister of Melissa Platt, a woman who died under mysterious and very suspicious circumstances. It's really incredible what you've done, given how just horrifically difficult this is for you to, to keep going and fighting for her um, she would be so proud she really would and just year after year after year of trying to go through the right channels the police the district attorney up to the, the, the attorney general the governor I mean we sent letters to all these people I I started contacting all these like major uh, news organizations and like Nancy Curry, I, all these people, like anybody I could and just nobody ever would get back to me, nobody. And then that's what set me on the path that I just had an epiphany and I said, you know what, I'm just gonna try this. I'm gonna contact these true crime YouTubers that, I've, that I watch and just see if maybe I can get exposure to a case, her case that way. Yeah. And that's how this whole thing started is because nothing else was working and i'm like i've got to do something i've got to do something and and the response has just been so heartwarming but it's kind of wild that you contact all these other professionals who are supposed to help and the only people who can really bring you that help are some girls on with google and youtube like it's just it's crazy that that's really where people that's all the only place people have to turn to at the end is getting that public support somehow. And it's amazing that we can do that, but it's yeah. just so sad and so broken. Another creator that I wanted to bring up in this vein is Sarah Turney, who made the Voices for Justice podcast about her sister, Alyssa Turney, who disappeared in 2001. It's a really interesting story. I really recommend listening to her podcast. Sarah strongly suspects that her father actually was responsible for her sister's murder. After the podcast came out, there was movement in the case, finally, after years of her not really hearing a lot from the detectives working on her sister's case, and finally, her father was arrested. The police have specifically said that the arrest didn't have anything to do with the podcast, but, I mean, it's pretty interesting timing. There's no way of knowing. 
But we've seen, like with podcasts like Serial, Serial comes out, it's a huge media frenzy, and then Sayad gets a new trial. I think that it's fair to speculate that having a lot of eyes on a case helps it get a lot of attention. Sarah Turney is also someone who's given talks at CrimeCon about ethics in true crime and consuming true crime responsibly. And she's talked about how she's been approached by, I think maybe documentarians or YouTubers who wanna make content about her sister's case. And she specifically said, while the trial is pending, I don't want people to be talking about the case because it's something that gets brought up with defense attorneys is they'll say, this case is so widely known, my uh, client can't possibly get a fair trial. So she's asking podcasters to simply not talk about the case. And she said that even though she's made her wishes known, some creators have said, well, I'm simply going to anyway. We can all agree that that's a pretty heinous attitude to have. We should all respect the relative's wishes. I feel like I couldn't leave this section behind without talking about Nicole Atkinson. Nicole Atkinson was close friends with Shanann Watts. She's the friend who reported Shanann Watts missing. And she has published a video specifically calling out YouTubers who make videos over and over again about Chris Watts revisiting the details of this solved case and who seemed to expect her to continually revisit this horrible time in her life. I'm going to try really hard to not start crying, but you want to message me and offer condolences or say something to me nice about my friend and her children? By all means, please do. They are appreciated. They are welcomed. But if you want to message me and ask me questions about what happened or that day, go fuck yourself. Really. Read the 2,000 pages of Discovery. Watch the fucking body cams. Like, it's all out there. Whether we wanted it out there or not, it's there. You've all taken it and you have done what you wanted with it. You've talked about it on groups and groups and groups. Um, people have taken it on YouTube. This is just how I feel about it. People have taken it and done however many videos on YouTube and made lots of money. Believe me, because I know how YouTube works. I have a YouTube channel now. I've been monetized. I know how that whole thing works. So, um, you take the videos and you talk about it over and over and over again. Stop being fucking basic. Like, get your own content. Make your own shit. Like, please, by all means, if you want to inspire somebody, make your own shit and inspire somebody. Quit taking hers and dissecting it and trying to figure out the why. Because we're never going to know the fucking why. Like, we're never going to. As much as we want to, we're not. It's nice to be checked up on, but it also sucks. It really, really sucks because you can be going about your day and for that one brief moment where you're just caught up in your day and you're finally not thinking about how it could have changed or what you could have done differently or what somebody else could have done differently, for that brief moment, you're not there anymore. And then you get a text message or a message from somebody and you pick up your phone to read it and you're taken right back there. In conclusion, I really recommend following creators like Sarah Turney who talk about ethics and true crime. Where I've been moving with my true crime interest is these days I try to consume podcasts and YouTube videos that are by people who have a strong connection to the case. They're people who have either specifically interviewed family members or their lawyers like Scott Reich on Crime Talk or lawyers and forensic psychologists like on a Hidden True Crime Podcast. They do great live streams about the Lori Vallow case if you know about that. And then my pals over at LA Not So Confidential uh, Dr. Shiloh and Dr. Scott are both psychologists who work with law enforcement. So when they talk about narcissism and gaslighting and psychopaths, they actually know what they're talking about. 
I'm not a perfect true crime consumer by any means, uh, but I want to be better. And that's it. Thank you.